Hi, this is a bit of an uh, impromptu type of video. I was out walking today and I thought about buying a new camera and I was going to sit down here and make a complete video about it for 2024. And then I realised I'd already made one. Now you can look back in my feed for it or you can just hang on a minute and I'm going to do the whole video again. I'm not actually going to make any changes to it. I think it's okay. It was soon after my stroke, I think, a couple of years ago, or maybe a year after my stroke. So I speak very slowly in it and I think about what I'm saying, which is probably better for you guys than listening to me go as fast as I am now. I have some differences. I've still got my X-Pro2. The reason I've got my X-Pro2 is because I've got my Signatron, the serial number. I've still got my X100F. and I've got my name on the serial number. And I've now got an X-T30. And I will just say, I haven't actually got the camera that I need for the way I shoot now. Now, I made a video about it a little while ago, and I'll put the link below. But the reason I bought the X-T30 was, as I explained a little while ago, to get the tilt-out screen so I could shoot at waist level. Um, it's not really working for me the way I thought it would. And because I'm 60 or 61 this year and the way I shoot's changed and I've had a layoff and the way I look at photography's changed I'm not sure whether this works for me or not I really don't know um I'm getting out it's slightly putting me off my favorite camera to shoot with of all time is the x100 whatever series it is this is the f um one of the main reasons I haven't gone out and bought the x106 is I haven't sold this, I can't sell this. At the end of the day, most people will go out and sell a camera to buy a camera. But because this one's got my serial number on, I'm sort of stuck. Do I want to go and spend 1,500 quid to 2,000 quid, depending on whether I want the limited edition one or not? My friends have gone out and got themselves an X106. They absolutely love it. Some have gone out the X105 and they love it. And the actual new sensor size and the lens and everything else is so much better for them. I know. I actually know that the new sensor size in the X100 would be so much better for me. I really do, but I can't sell that. So it makes it a little bit difficult. I suppose I could sell it, but would you? Do you know what I mean? It's a funny old thing. Um, a caveat to the tilt out screen, etc. You know, the, the other thing about the new X100 is it has a tilt out screen. I probably wouldn't have needed to buy this. There is a little bit of extra length with putting a lens on here and being able to zoom. Um, I know a lot of people don't like that sort of thing in street photography, but it's whatever works for you. And as I get older and I think about it, sometimes that works for me and then other days it doesn't. I'd much prefer to have an X100 around my neck. I'm confusing you, I know, but I'm confusing myself. At the end of the day, we've got to use what camera works for us. The biggest thing, the biggest trap in 2004, before we get into the other video, is there's still a disconnect. These camera manufacturers are not making it easy for us just to transfer to our iPhones or our iPads. They've got different apps and things. They don't work very well. It's a damn sight easier for me to take a memory card out of a camera, stick it in a, a card transfer, and then put it on my computer, or put it on my iPad, and then put it on my phone. I just wish it was easier. You're like, my phone can connect to my computer or my iPad in seconds and just transfer all the images over. They don't seem to have got this right, the, the camera manufacturers. And I know this sounds really stupid. When you go out with your iPhone and you take a photograph, you can edit it and have it online, if that's what you want to do, in seconds. It is super quick and super easy. Going from a camera to an iPad or an iPhone takes a little bit more time. And I know it's only minutes or seconds, but it does make a difference to the way you think about things. Now, I know some people can go out and shoot for months and months and months and just sit on all their images and then go through them. I wanted to get it all over and done with while it's fresh in my mind. And one of the main reasons I do that, some people like to sit on something and let it percolate and have a look at it later on. But when I see a photograph and frame an image and shoot it, I have the look I'm looking for in my mind fresh. If I can get home, get that onto a device as quickly as possible, and then get it, get it edited and get it output, then that's what works for me. Everything's different for every other people. I actually haven't got the camera I want at the moment. In fact, I don't think anyone makes the camera I want at the moment. But the, my ideal camera is still the X100, and I'm still very, 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 very tempted 
to go out and buy the X106. I don't know what's holding me back. I always said I wouldn't get another X100 until the X110. Sounds mad for you, summer people, it's a long way away. But just like my iPhones, I'm videoing this now on an iPhone 14, whereas the video that you're about to watch was made on a 12. I didn't get the 14, I didn't get the, sorry, the, the 13, I didn't get the 15, I will get the 16 just to keep myself up to date with camera technology. Even though phones don't move on that much, I want to sort of keep a camera that the battery works in warranty and also get good value for money when I trade my phone in. So if I trade my iPhone 14 in, I'll get five, six hundred pounds towards the new iPhone and then I've only got to lay out about five hundred pounds. Still a lot of bloody money, I know. But at the end of the day, as my other video will say, a lot of people don't want to spend that much money on a camera. You know, at the end of the day, my X100F or whatever, or whatever's coming out recently, you're looking at fifteen hundred pounds to a thousand pounds when you know, two or three years ago when I made this next video you're about to watch, it was about a thousand pound. I talk in my next video about what I kept and what I got rid of. And one of the things is I got rid of my GFX when I stopped doing that type of photography. But I've got to tell you, my GFX was the best camera I ever had for a multitude of reasons. Um, it was, uh, my D3, D3S was probably my best DSLR I ever had. The only trouble with that is, is the constant sensor cleaning used to drive me insane. When I got my GFX, it sort of reminded me of going back to a DSLR. I got the work output that I needed to get output from that camera to sell it. And then the camera wasn't worth anything to me. And then I came up to retirement, so I just sold it off. There's no secret to that. You know, my ideal would be to jam a um, GFX sensor into an X100 sounds crazy mad but if you had that type of thing no sensor cleaning or anything else it would be an absolute amazing thing to have at the end of the day anyway I'm not going to make another video this is an introduction to my next video um, this video is on, on my YouTube channel but it's way back it probably won't be seen and it's probably got the wrong hashtags and the wrong um, drivers to make the algorithm drive people to it and pick modern style of things that I, I don't know at the end of the day i was called a dinosaur i've been called a dinosaur a long time ago but funny really because there's been such a fascination with dinosaurs it's unbelievable and some people would even like to bring dinosaurs back so maybe when i'm de dead and extinct maybe someone will want to bring me back and talk about photography who knows i do these videos um because i want to because it helps me to think about photography and it helps some people and even if it helps one person to choose and get the right camera for them that works for me the next video is not brand specific, even though I do talk about Fujifilm a lot. But at the end of the day, I left Nikon for Fujifilm and I stay with a brand, as I explain in the next video, because there's no point in chopping and changing and it costing you an absolute fortune to jump. I have noticed recently a lot of Fujifilm shooters are jumping from Fujifilm to Leica. There's nothing wrong with that at all. In fact, I always said when I retired and I gave up photography as such, I would probably get a Leica because it's the camera that everyone dreams of getting. I didn't do it. I haven't got a Leica. Some of my friends are going out now and buying Leica Qs and some are buying Leica M10s and Leica black and white cameras. I'd love Fujifilm to make a black and white camera. So if you're listening Fujifilm, please make an X100 special edition black and white camera one day. I think you'd have an amazing market for it. Even if it was a couple of grand, I think people would spend the money on it at the end of the day, especially if it's limited edition black and white camera. Who knows? There's one for you to think about if anyone's watching from Fujifilm. My ideal camera definitely would be an X100 with it. And I know you're never going to fit a GFX sensor in it because it's probably the size of that screen. But my perfect ideal camera would be a rangefinder style camera with a great big sensor in it that I could just hang around my neck, get out, take photographs, enjoy, never have to clean the sensor or change lenses. Who knows, maybe someone will make one one day. Anyway, the next video is quite long, or this video is quite long. This video is quite long. Um, it's about 25 minutes, but it explains everything you need to know from starting out to buying a camera to even if you're a pro. Um, it doesn't give you everything in the way of love, wildlife photography, and it's not that up to date. And as I say, it's still relevant after two years. Um, there's a few little things in it I obviously aren't the same, i.e. it's 2024 and I've got an iPhone 14, as I said. Um, there's a couple of little tiny bits in it that I've looked at today that I don't think I would change, but they're possibly not relevant. But as I say, um, 
the, some of the cameras I still talk about in there, you can still buy it and they're still usable and you can still go out and get them. And as I've spoken a lot about um, older cameras on my video, then you can go and have a look at MPB and everything else and see what you can get for your money. Because at the end of the day, some of the older cameras that were being spoken about two years ago on this video are actually even cheaper today. So good luck, enjoy the video and I'll see you on the next one. Same t-shirt, different locations. <laughs> um, I've just been out for a walk with Jake and I had a long think while I was out, what, what was the next video going to be? And I thought I might as well start at the beginning for a lot of people, and that is, which it shouldn't be actually, but that is, what camera do I buy? That is the biggest question I ever got asked, or the most common question I ever got asked when I was a professional photographer and working, photog doing photography as a living. I used to get emails, messages on social media, what should I buy for my first camera for me? And what should I buy for my first camera for my daughter, my son, whatever. It's more complicated than you will believe. You've got to think about input and output, i.e. do you want to shoot digital as an input? Do you want to shoot analog as an input? What are you outputting it as? Are you going to shoot billboard size posters? Or are you just going to put it on Instagram? Also, what's the budget? Have you got a budget that is very, very small? Or have you got, are you a multi-millionaire and you've got a completely huge budget, you can buy whatever you like? That matters and also it complicates things. I've seen people walk into camera shops in London and say, what's the best camera you've got? And actually it was a Leica store, so it was a 20,000 pound camera. And then when you put it on the counter for the guy, the guy said, that's all I need then. The guy said, well, you might want a lens for it. And then he spent another £7,000 on a lens. Just to put around his neck to show it off, um, I think, to be honest. And so when you're carrying that around your neck, you've got to have private security, I expect. So that's another, another thing to think about as well. And that is, do you want £20,000 or £50,000 hanging around your neck in the way of a camera? Or do you just want 500 quid or 50 quid? There is so much to think about. I am going to do the best I can to answer that question today. It won't be brand specific. It won't be all about Fujifilm. Even though I was a Fujifilm brand ambassador and I still use Fujifilm to this day, I don't get paid by anyone to tell you what camera to buy. So this is actually truth from my heart, what I think you should do. And the truth is, at the moment, let's start off at the same at the beginning and finish at the end the same. I think you should use what you've got. And if you've got a smartphone in your pocket, then use that. A lot of people ask me over the last couple of years, what should I get, what should I get? And I used to think, well, what phone you've got in your pocket? And they say, well, I've got an iPhone such and such or a Samsung such and such. And I think, well, okay then, so what's your budget? And they used to go, well, my budget's two, 300 pound for a camera. And I used to think, well, you've got a thousand pound smartphone in your pocket, but you've only got 300 pound for a camera. And I used to think to myself, first of all, you're not very serious about photography, this won't last. But also the sensor in their phone would be better than a two, three hundred pound camera. There are other options. You've got MPB, you've got Wilkinson cameras, you've got WEX, they all do second hand. And some of these places are the best places to go. WEX do a thing called OB, which is open box. And I've bought several cameras from WEX under the OB. And I'm shocked when you get them, when, you, when they're delivered to you and you open them up and you think to yourself, that's brand new. And it is because OB means open box, which means the chances are it's just been out of the box for someone to look at and put back in the box. It's never been used. So you save 500 and sometimes a thousand pound off the new price just because the box has been open. So watch out for that on WEX. MPB wise, they obviously do different levels from as new down to badly abused really. So you could have a badly abused camera that would cost normally 1400 pounds and you probably pick that up for two or 300 pounds. So you can pick these good cameras up for less money, but they might look like a a bag of shit basically so it all depends and then you can also look pawn shop options you know like CEX or whatever they're called and some of these high street stores that have got second-hand gear in stock and then funny enough they've got second-hand um, smartphones in stock as well so if you can't afford a reasonably good camera then maybe get a reasonably good smartphone and use that the advantage of a smartphone is very very simple they're readily available, they're reasonably cheap if you buy them second hand, and you can also take a photograph and upload it to the internet within minutes. You can take it, edit it with apps, and then get it online. And if that's the type of photography you wanna do, then why not start with a smartphone? 
as I say, it's all about output as well. Now, if you're just starting out in photography, the chances are you are not going to want to output billboard size images. So you're not going to want medium format or full frame. If you're just putting it on Instagram or on the internet, you're just going to want 1.6 crop or even micro four thirds or something like that. You're not going to want to go mad. If you're going to print, okay, you want the best print wallet you can get. So uh, you know, 1.6 crop, full frame, medium format, if you want to go that mad. You've got to remember the bigger the sensor, the more money it's going to cost. Also, the bigger the sensor, the dirtier the sensor is going to get, the more you're going to have to set for sensor cleaned. If you've got a medium format camera and you're shooting wide open fast, then you're going to have dust all over the sensor. You're going to have to have the sensor cleaned regularly in the summer. Some of the older full frame sensors, like on the Nikon D3S and stuff like that, used to suck dust in like you've never seen. I used to clean my medium, uh, my Nikon D3S full frame sensor once a day in the summer and in the winter about once a month. Now then, if you can't do it yourself, that's 50 odd pound in a retail store to have it cleaned. Brand, let's talk about brand. Nikon say if anyone can, sorry, sorry Canon say if anyone can, Canon can. Canon can and Nikon say I am Nikon but you're you want to find a camera that suits you now it could be Canon Nikon Fujifilm Samsung Sony whatever you want it's got to feel good in your hand also you've got to be able to understand the menus I've not used a lot of I mean I've used a lot of cameras and but very few brands and I know that a lot of people talk about how difficult the Sony menu system is the truth is once you've got your camera set up you just want the exposure triangle on the outside of the camera so you can adjust things like shutter speed, aperture. You know, at the end of the day, you want it there. You want to be able to just dial it in when you can see it. You don't want to be searching through menus to have a look for it. Do you want a viewfinder? Do you want the viewfinder in the middle, like on the SLR style camera? Or do you want it on the outside, like the rangefinder style camera? Or do you want a viewfinder at all? Just, you're just happy using the screen on the back. Obviously, if you're just using it on the screen on the back, it's the same as a smartphone. And there's some occasions when you're out in bright light, it's probably quite hard to see. That's why a view viewfinder comes in handy. My personal choice has always been rangefinder, and the reason I like the rangefinder style is because the viewfinder's at one side, so when I'm actually photographing people, I can see what's going on around me, especially street photography-wise. And also, if I'm actually photographing people doing portraits, etc., they can see my face, and it's not someone hiding behind a camera looking through a central viewfinder, which I find a bit strange, because you're actually talking to someone saying, move this way, stand that way, put this, your hand this way, smile, whatever, stand closer together from there. And you're doing all that and people can't see you. So rangefinder style for shooting people and doing street photography, I just find a personal choice is my favorite. Obviously a lot of cameras, you can have tilting screens and everything else. Loads and loads and loads of choice. Personally, personally, my choice isn't gonna be your choice. So I can't talk about that today. It's a bit like me trying to tell you to buy Adidas trainers when you like Nike or to drink Pepsi when you like Coke. You're gonna formulate an idea about what camera you want before you've, you've even spoken to me or anyone else and before you've even walked in a shop. Your parents or your friends may have used Nikon all their lives. The chances are you're gonna buy Nikon. If your parents have driven a Ford, you're gonna buy a Ford. If they've driven a Vauxhall, you're gonna buy a Vauxhall. If they've driven a BMW, you're gonna buy a BMW. Don't get caught up in the bollocks though, right? So there was a guy walked into a camera shop uh, a couple of years ago in London and there was a choice he was trying to make a choice and he kept coming over to us and we we're on the fuji stand and he was coming over to us because he was either whether to buy the leica or the panasonic they were exactly the same camera one had a red badge on saying leica the other one had a panasonic badge on exactly the same camera exactly the same there was a 1500 pound i think it was price difference personally straight away if they're the same i would have bought the cheaper Panasonic camera because I'm a photographer and I want to take photographs. The guy in the end bought the one that had the red dot on it. And I said to him, why, why, why did you choose that camera? He goes, well, it's got a red dot on it. It's a Leica, isn't it? And I thought, right, I don't get it. Like, I, and I still to this day don't get it. Fine, if he's got the money to go and spend on that and to put that camera around his neck and say, look what I've got. If that's what he wants to do, fine. But cameras aren't jewelry. And there seems to be a growing trend of just buying something because you've got the money to stick it around your neck to say, look what I've got. In this day and age, it's madness. Because yes, you may have a load of money, but like the, with the guy that bought the 10,000 pound, 20,000 pound Leica, 
You've now got to walk around that uh, your neck in London or whatever if you're going to do street photography. You want to walk around with a 20,000 pound camera and a, and a 6,000 pound lens hanging off it, walking around the street without private security. Good luck with keeping it. It's as simple as that. Now, if you can afford it and you can afford private security, who am I to say don't do it? Do it. Have, have fun and enjoy carrying it around. But the point of fact is, photography is about learning photography. I would personally start off, like I said on my previous video, I started off with a box brownie and moved on to things like Ricoh KR10, Nikon FM2, Zenit E, Zenit TTL. And a lot of those cameras back then I bought new because they were like they were peanuts, like the, Nikon, the, uh, the uh, Zenit now you can pick it up for £16. I recommend if you're going to get your kids into photography, maybe start with film. It's a really, really, really good learning curve. You can pick up a film camera for £16, £20 from any secondhand store or online and then go and get some film, run it through the camera, take some photographs, learn all about developing and printing. It's a really, really good way to start. If you've got a smartphone, stick with that. If not, and you want to get your kids into it, start off with film. I know a lot of people that work for camera companies and camera manufacturers that have actually started their kids off with film because it's a really good learning curve. It's not cheap, I suppose, when you start looking at um, how much film you can develop and how much it costs to develop and print. But at the end of the day, it also teaches them not to rattle off millions of photographs. Yes, buying digital, memory is cheap. You can take as many photographs as you like, um, but the, the, half of them are going to just sit on the memory cards and half of people aren't going to look at them properly. When you actually learn that you've got a roll of 36 exposure or 12 exposure film and that's all you've got, you actually think about your shot and you carefully compose your shot and you really do think about what every single shot you take. Whereas with digital, you just rattle off thousands and thousands and thousands. And sometimes you don't ever get to look at them and to see which is a good photograph and which is a bad photograph. If you're going to go for any camera, think about how you're going to purchase that and where from. I recommend going into a shop. Yes, you can buy off on, online these days, but you don't get the feel. You need to put that camera in your hand and you need to get a feel for it. And brand wise, choose whatever you want. I'm not going to tell you what to choose. One of my recommendations would be a fixed lens camera like the X100F, and it doesn't have to be an X100F, because the more time you spend with a fixed lens shooting a style of photography, the more you'll learn about it. If you spend a year to two years with a fixed lens camera, you're gonna learn a lot. You can't zoom, no, but you can zoom with your feet. You can walk backwards and forwards. Okay, if you're shooting landscape photography, there is a few problems with that. If you're standing on the edge of a cliff and you wanna get closer to a lighthouse, you can't jump off the cliff and swim through the sea to try and get closer. So it is limiting for that style of photography. If it's, but, but I know a lot of landscape photographers that use the X100F. They climb mountains, they go out for the day, and the beauty of this camera is that's all you take with you. You haven't got 16 lenses, you haven't got a load of other stuff, you just take that with you. A lot of people will go out and buy six or seven lenses and a camera, and those lenses, half will stay at home, some, some will go in the backpack, they'll go out all day, and the only thing they'll use is the lens that they put on the camera. And some days you can't change lenses anyway. It's pouring with rain or it's a dust storm. You're on a beach. And the last thing you want to be doing is changing lenses and getting all dust inside your camera. So fixed lens camera is what I recommend or a smartphone. When you start looking at lenses and start looking at the style of photography you're doing, it's very difficult. The one thing I'll struggle to talk about today is wildlife photography because, you know, most wildlife photographers will start off with a um, so maybe a 1.6 crop camera with a 600 mil lens, something like that. And the problem with that is, you know, you're going to spend a couple of thousand pounds on a camera, maybe, and then seven thousand pounds on a 600 mil lens. And how often are you going to use that? And if you're a hobby photographer, hardly at all. So the best way to go about that is hire it from somewhere like hire a camera, or at least buy your body and then hire your 600 millimeter lens when you're going to use it. Even professionals do that. They don't have thousands and thousands of pounds worth of lenses sitting around at home. They just take out the insurance and take out the lens on the day where they need it. So that's a little bit more of a complicated subject and it's the same with landscape because you may need a selection of lenses, but you don't need them all now. You really don't need them all now. You just need to go out and practice first of all. It's a whole lot of difference if you're a really good photographer and you're asking what camera should I get next. It's a little bit more of a difficult subject and it's probably something we'd have to sit down and talk about. But we, you know, if you, if you are interested in that, send me a message, email me. It's a bit the same as if you've been using a camera and a few lenses for a while and you don't know what lens to get next. Well, one of the things you can do is look at what you've taken. If you've got zoom lenses and you're thinking about getting primes, 
then you can actually go into your Lightroom catalog and see what focal length you've been shooting at. And you might find that most of the images you've taken in the last six months, you shot a 27 mil. So the answer to that is go and buy a 27 mil lens. Are you shooting in bright light or are you shooting in low light? The difference is, is if you're shooting in low light, you want a faster lens like a 1.4 or something like that and not 4.5 because it's a lot harder. You have to put your ISO up to actually get the shots, which creates more grain. But I'll show you something. That's a 16mm 1.4. Great big piece of glass in the front for letting lots and lots of light in. And that's a 16mm 1.2 f2. So see the difference in size. One's a great big lump of pro glass and the other one is just a one and a half stops less and it's a lot smaller and lighter, easy to carry. And that's another consideration. Do you want to go to the extremes of that or will that do? And on most days with you know about 800 ISO or something other than a bit dull, that's fine. If you want that, that does give you slightly different, I'm going to pronounce it differently, but Booker or whatever it is, uh, effects. But at the end of the day, you can hardly see them unless you've processed the image right and you've photographed it right in the right light and you've got your focus right. There's a lot to consider. Bodies wise, I've just shown you my X100F. Actually, all the camera bodies I've got these days are an X-Pro2, an X-Pro3 and my X100F. That is it, All everything else is gone. The interesting thing is, if I'm doing a shoot these days, and I hardly do, I'm retired, finished, but I did do a shoot for a friend the other day in the woods. And all I took along with me is X Pro 3 with a 70 to 300 on it, and an X Pro 2 with an 18 to 55 on it. That gets me the whole range I need. They're not particularly fast lenses, but they did everything I need. The stabilization on them is great, so I don't need them to be particularly fast. Even in the woods, it was quite dark. Both these lenses and cameras performed absolutely perfectly, and with an ISO of about 500. Absolutely brilliant, great day out, easy to use, perfect. So don't go rushing out and buy two camera bodies. <laughs> a lot of things happened over the years. Cameras got cheaper and people thought, oh, I'll have this, I'll have that. Some people's dream camera would be an X100F. Some people can afford to have six camera bodies, but you don't need them. The reason a professional photographer has two camera bodies is the last thing you need is to turn up on a shoot and a camera fail. Very rare these days, very rare. It can happen. Most of the time it'll be a memory card's got corrupt and it'll damage the camera. But the worst thing that can happen is you're out shooting, you drop a camera in a pond or a lake or the sea or something like that. So at least it gives you a backup. As an amateur photographer, you don't need that. You may lose the photographs you've got on the day, which will be a little bit upsetting, but it's not critical. You haven't got a client you've got to worry about and pay. So what do you do? I recommend you go into a camera shop. If it's for your daughter or your son, go in a camera shop and talk to them. So see about what you want to do. Go into somewhere like Wilkinson's, Wex, Park Cameras, Go in there, go and talk to the knowledgeable staff. I know in my time, there's been some horror stories of people going in and saying, I wanna buy this camera and I've got this budget and people in the store being rude to them. It doesn't happen as much these days as it used to do. It does happen though. I've had some horror stories, I'm not gonna mention the shops, where one lady um, got some inheritance, decided she wanted to go and buy her dream camera gear and the guy said, what do you want all that for and this that, and the other and he was just rude to her a because she was a woman and b because of the fact that she had the money and he couldn't afford to do the same thing it was horrendous one of the worst things i've ever heard in my life and the lady was actually telling me this story when i was teaching her photography outside the actual store so very embarrassing it's rare it doesn't happen don't take notice of what i've just said but go and talk to these knowledgeable staff but before you go in ask yourself some questions what am I going to use this camera for? Now, if you're, it's your son and your daughter and they're going off to college or university, the first thing that's going to happen is you're going to buy them a camera and then they're going to get to university. And it's like that first thing when you've got a new pair of trainers on. You think you've got the best trainers in the world and you work into, walk into school and everyone else has got these new fantastic trainers that do all this, that and the other. And then your son and daughter think you've let them down and you've bought them the wrong thing. Do some research. Decide what's going to make them happy, what they're going to use, how much you can afford decide on brand etc don't jump from brand to brand people do that people think oh that guy's taken some fantastic photographs with that Canon I'm gonna move from Nikon to Canon that guy's taken this and that uh, this with this camera that guy's taken fantastic photographs this lady has taken some amazing shots with that Panasonic this person's done this this person it goes on and on and on don't jump around for brands I'll tell you a story my very first what X100F I bought 
I bought off eBay. I bought the camera, there was an exchange between the guy and myself over email. I bought the camera, he asked me what I did, I told him, I showed him my Instagram account anyway. I went out using his X100F, I'd taken a load of photographs with it, and he emailed me probably three or four months later and he said, Matt, my, my daughter's just said to me, Dad, why didn't that camera take photographs like that when you had it? I was quite chuffed, it was quite funny, but it's so true. Chopping and changing camera brands just because someone can take better photographs with a camera brand isn't the camera brand. It's the six inches you're in there behind the camera, not the camera itself. So don't get caught up in that, I've got to have this and I've got to have that because that person takes better photographs. This day and age, it's all about your vision, your composition, what you're photographing, your projects, your processing. It's all about you. It's not about the camera. You can do it with anything, and that's why I recommend a smartphone. I would start off every time with a smartphone. The iPhone 12 Pro Max, I use it all the time at the moment. It's got a zoom, a standard lens, and a super wide, and also I can process everything in camera. And if I want to get really, really close, I can use my X-Pro3 with a 300mm lens. And I don't carry around great big, huge lenses, and I have done. A friend of mine, I was talking to him the other day, we've both been there. We've both had tons and tons and tons of camera gear, and now we're all down to a, a few lenses and a couple of cameras, and that's about it. I go out with my iPhone, as I say, and one camera maybe, and sometimes that camera doesn't come out of my bag, and I use the phone all day. For me, it's about, at the moment in my life, it's about taking some photographs, enjoying myself, be out in the fresh air, getting a few photographs on Instagram, um, and obviously doing a bit of YouTube stuff. In the past when I was printing, yes, I'd want full frame or medium format to get absolutely perfect, fantastic prints. And if I was shooting this commercial stuff, I'd want great big cameras, with great, sorry, great big sensors to actually do that. I don't need that anymore. So don't get caught up in it. It's a bit like buying a camper van. You buy a camper van, and you look around, you see what everyone else has got. You buy a Kadak to, to cook on, you buy this, you buy that. Suddenly you've got all this stuff. And then you think, well, in the summer I'm going to need an awning, I'm going to need this, and I'm going to need that. In the winter you don't take anything. You just take what you've got in your van. And it's the same with everything in life these days. You get caught up in the got to have this and got to have that. And you really haven't. So what I'm trying to do to say today is you don't need tons of stuff. You don't need several camera bodies. You don't need hundreds of lenses. Please just start out with a camera that suits you. I used to recommend a camera, a G7X Mark II or Mark III to people when they start out because it's got a zoom range that's quite long and it's quite a fast lens and it's a great little camera. I think it's micro th uh, two thirds, but it does everything you need and you can even upload from it from the internet, etc., etc. There is a couple of steps you have to go through to do it. So before you even think about going out and looking for a camera, think about input and output. Think about the time it's gonna take to produce the images and does that even matter? And preferably start off by doing some projects for, with the camera you've got or the smartphone you've got and learn a lot about photography. Buy some books, study books, study up before you go and look at cameras and then go into a camera shop. Trust me, the other thing that's gonna happen when you walk in a camera shop as well is they're gonna to recommend to you, some of them a camera that they're getting sponsored to sell you or, or they get commission off of or it's going to be a DSLR style camera because that's what they're used to selling to people. If you go in there and say your um, son or daughter is going to college and they're going to do photography, the chances are these people are going to try and ram a Canon or a Nikon DSLR into you because that's what they're used to doing. Whereas that's not the way anymore. I, I would recommend more of a mirrorless camera or a mirrorless style camera. A lot easier. Less sense to dust and less things to clean. So just be careful before you go in a camera store. Be very careful, have a lot of thought about it. You know, park cameras, Wilkinson cameras, etc. they're all good, but go in there with an idea first. It's always an interesting thing. I used to sell motorcycles for a living as well, and people that came in and know what they wanted, it was easy to deal with. The people that didn't know what they wanted, it was more difficult. Some bike shops used to just ram a bike into people because they've got eight grand to spend, and some people would really consider about what they're gonna be riding it for. And it's the people that consider that are important. It's no good me selling a sports bike for £8,000 to someone that's going to go out and kill themselves on it. It's probably better for me to recommend an old junk of a bike that they're going to fall off five or six times until they get used to it. It's the same as you, you know, when I said earlier. Your son or your daughter, you're going to buy them a Lamborghini when they pass their test or you're going to buy them a beat them up Fiesta and bump it a few times. And it is the same with a camera. 
you can maybe afford to buy a 10, 20,000 pound Leica, but do you want to have it around your neck and you, do you want to drop it and break it or do you want it stolen off you? There's a lot of considerations. I recommend in photography, everyone should really start at the bottom and work their way up. It's like buying a motorbike, you know, buy a 50cc, then a 125 and then work your way up from there. Jumping on a great big fast bike isn't the way to go. And it's the same with photography. Start out with something simple, easy to use, even like back in the old days of Olympus Trip, you know, or Olympus Pen these days, or a X100F or a phone. Start off with the basics. Learn the craft of photography and then work your way up. Because as you learn the craft of photography, then you'll learn what camera you want. You want the exposure triangle on the outside and you want to be able to use it easily without complicated menus like on the Sonys, etc. So use the, get used to photography first. Use the camera you've got on you or the smartphone you've got in your pocket and slowly work your way up. No matter who you are and how much money you've got, it's always the best way to do it. That's my recommendation. Catch you on the next video.